Hey everyone, Mark Hayward from the Absolute Business Mindset podcast from YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today we have an interview with Marcio Santos, who is a digital marketer. Now we talk about his career and his business and his education, which is interesting, that covers Vienna, Ottawa and Brasilia. And, and then after his education, we talk a lot about his gaming industry experience, where he was at the pioneering stage of setting up a gaming league in Brazil, which he had to sell, or what did sell. And the challenges of actually selling a uh, business is really fascinating for me. And it really wasn't interesting to talk to him about that. Then we go deep into his business, which is Nerd Digital, which is creating online learning for his clients. And he had some great stories about how he's built businesses, how he scaled businesses uh, by using these online platforms. And we talk about the great thing, which is that we talk about the future of his business, which has great scaling opportunities as well. And then we go into the quick fire round as well at the end of the interview. So thank you very much for listening and watching. And if you are enjoying this, please do give it a like. Please just do a subscribe and click the bell icon. And anytime I release a video, you will get to see it. So thank you very much. And over to me and Marcio in the interview. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into the area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Marcio Santos, who is a digital marketer. Hello, Marcio. How are you? Hey, Mark, I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm really good. Thank you. Really good. Um, going into the first question, which I've introduced is the podcast is called Absolute Business Mindset. What does business mindset mean to you? Hmm. I think uh, a business mindset for me means uh, I'm stealing this from from this guy named Ash. He says that the goal of a business is to create happy customers. And I think the business mindset is, you know, a series of, of frameworks in your mind that help you to create happy customers. How do you, uh, inside the business itself, how's the business producing and, and transferring value, but also how's the business capturing value? I think those two sides of the equation are, are part of what makes a, a business mindset. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, going into education, so your education was, so you did a degree in Vienna, is that right? That's right. And then, and then you did a business admin degree in Brasilia. So what, I, computer science and, and business go hand in hand these days, especially. But what, why, why, did, why was one in Vienna, one in Brasilia? Yeah, so I actually started my, is it? Yeah, I started college in Ottawa, actually. And the reason why I was, I was moving around was my mother. She was working for Brazilian Foreign Affairs before she retired. And I was still young and I, I lived with her. And so when she moved from Ottawa, where she was living, to Vienna, I went with her and started my BA there and um, was not able to finish because her posting was not going to last that long. And so I moved back to Ottawa. I did a, a, went back to college, did this e-business web developer program at Algonquin College. Right. That was great. Learned a whole lot from languages that people don't even use anymore. Um, like, so that was fun. And then after that, uh, I was in Canada. I wasn't able to renew my work permit. That okay. was a, that was an issue. And so I had to return to Brazil. And when I landed in Brazil, my mindset was, yeah, I got to get back to Canada. I want to get back. That's where all my contacts are, my girlfriend. That's what, what's yeah. my world. And my mom, she says, no. Why don't you just do the exam, see if you can get into university here? And I was like, Mom, I've been out of Brazil for 10 years. I, I barely speak Portuguese anymore. Like, I'm never going to pass. And I, lo and behold, I went in, wrote the exam, passed. And so I started my business degree in Brazil. And, and now, I'm, yeah, now I'm here. Where are you now? Where are you based now? I'm in Toronto. Now You're I'm in, in Toronto. Toronto. You, you got back to Canada. I got back to Canada after a long time, a long road, windy road. Because you... you... Uh, you, you co-founded Super Game League in Brazil, so this is this is really interesting. So it was a a gaming league that you created 
in 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 Brazil? What, what was obviously you're a gamer, but what what was the inspiration behind that? Yeah, so in 2004, I I participated in the World Cyber Games. They had a uh, this is the old school, let's call it uh, video game Olympics, wow. and they had an event in Brazil, and they had qualifiers. I I kind of just stumbled upon this qualifier, went to it, and I I qualified for nationals. And I never made it to the world finals, but I was just always so interested in the mix about gaming and all the stuff. And at some point I was invited to go to the world championships to be what they call it, an arbiter, a referee. And so I went there and I saw Brazilians competing at the highest level. And I was like, man, why, why aren't we winning these gold medals? I want my, my countrymen to win. And so when I left Italy, the, the, comp, the, the world cyber games that year was in Monza and in Italy on the racetrack which is oh, really amazing. cool yeah yeah cool. Yeah, it was really cool man we i flew back i had this in my mind I was like man, we have we have to have a league in brazil we have to have a league in brazil we have to have people competing at a high level on a consistent basis winning money being in front of crowds being in front of like this high pressure situation mm. so that when they get to the world cyber games they can win and so i i went back to brazil i talked to some people some more people got some funding bought a website built that up and then eventually sold it uh, but it's really interesting like now gaming is a huge mega business millionaires are made at 17 years old or 16 years old where kids are, are playing all sorts of games and and being could you could you have foreseen that at, when you were doing it did you did you think it was going to be a massive industry yes we, we we definitely saw it was going to be huge but we didn't know how we could be part of it one thing that was clear was that from the business side the way we were running our business we would sell sponsorships and we would um create these tournaments and sell those tournaments as as opportunities for sponsors but we didn't do a very good job of doing of scaling that side of creating the tournaments okay um i think we this the, the unit economics was not right to to begin with and I, I think it could have worked well but just i i didn't have i wasn't resourceful enough to to think through um what how we needed to restructure the business in, in order to make it work so um but it, it was it was fun man. that sounds brilliant uh what what's um uh, so you you sold the company did you say right. how was that selling selling the company because I, I i virtually everyone that i hear who i've interviewed and spoken to who have sold a business the, especially the first one is a bit of a car crash to be honest it's it's quite difficult you don't always get the best deal that you could have got what was your experience of selling your first business that, that was pretty accurate right there that description <laughs> car crash headaches um you know looking back you're like oh my god i gave away like i bet i probably gave away the business you know so when i look at just like the size of our email list that i had like it was you know tens of thousands of of, of subscribers but more specifically they were gamers males mostly between the ages of like 15 and like 26 27 mm. so you know if if i had access to a list like that today uh, it, it, like if i understood what i had back then I, I i would have oh man i would have done something different what would you have done differently sold it for more money or would you have structured it differently the exit what how, how would have you done it differently now what you know now Oh, I would have done. So at the very beginning, I would have taken more. A more regional approach to the model. So the model that I adopted, the business model was something that was working in the US and and in Europe. And I tried essentially just to copy and to rebrand things and to do them in Brazil, yeah. whereas the better thing would have been to do take a take a more deeper look at what were really the games how what was the infrastructure like in brazil because there was opportunity but i just i didn't look for it because i was again focused on copying instead of focusing on on my consumer and focusing on okay how can we get more games uh, more tournaments to them so that's that's the most important thing that i would have done differently uh and then after that i would have done i would have not given away so much prize money so that was something that was super expensive and we gave away too much prize money at the beginning. We thought that it would attract a lot of, of viewers and we built like a, a huge tournament, like one of our Dota tournaments, for example, we had 
uh, 1,500 players in our tournament, which at the time was like the largest tournament in all of Latin America, probably in, in the world at the time for, for Dota. And we, we gave a lot of prize money and then that tournament was worth it. We had sponsors and sponsorship and prizes and stuff, but for our other smaller weekly tournaments, I, I definitely would have scaled back on our prizes. So, and then, and then the exit too, the exit would have been way more structured and probably wouldn't even have sold it. I was just about to say, do you, do you regret, or like, do you, do you feel that you could have kept that business and kept it running and perhaps even spread to other areas? For sure. I, mean, I don't feel regret, but I do. When you, when you talk about if I were to stop and think about it, I definitely feel like, man, I, I really let that one go. You know, that was, I, that was a, a really big opportunity and, and that one kind of slipped through my fingers. So. It's your first business or one of your first businesses. We all make mistakes in, in business, especially the first ones. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about Nerd Digital. Why don't you tell me about that? You're the founder of it. Why don't you tell me what the business model is and, and what you do? So at Nerd Digital, what we do is we coach course creators to scale to six figures in six months. Um, we, in, in the marketplace of, of online education, of e-learning, we see a ton of opportunity because the workforce today is, is facing this uphill battle against rapid change and AI and machine learning. And the, the biggest challenge is not going to be learning new skills, it's dealing with the psychological and emotional pressures of, of learning new skills. How do you reinvent yourself over and over and over again? I'm 41. Um, when I'm 45 and then I'm 50 and then I'm 55 and I'm 60. And if I'm going to live longer and work longer, how do I continue to do that and go through these progressions and progress to positions that are more and more complicated? I need online education because if I'm going to hire a university to get that job done for me, they're just not fast enough. Hmm. and so that's that's what we do that's that's what i'm super passionate about and that's uh what i do every day it's, it's quite a nice niche client. like i i don't mean niche as in a, a like as a belittling in it it's a really nice little business like section of online training that look we through covid especially we were bombarded with webinars on zoom and 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 there is a place for those Absolutely. I, I, I feel a little bit Zoom fatigued. I'm, I'm actually introducing telephone calls back into back into my life just to not be on Zoom. Uh, mm. But um, so the, it, but it is a really nice business. If you can build that business and build clients that, that, that can scale. And as you say, the numbers that you're you're quoting, it, it, it's, it's really it's a really powerful, powerful business model. I hope so, Mark. I hope so. I mean. Um, what we've been doing for the past four months is simply refining the product. So instead of building out a course and, and kind of putting it online, we've been working one-on-one -on -one with clients that already have a course and refining what we have to help them market their courses. And so we've worked with, uh, you may know him, his name is Kay He from radreads.co and he, he runs a blog, he has his course named Supercharged Productivity. We work with him, helped him go from five-figure launches to six-figure launches. and We've worked with some other people like the Capital Allocators, uh, Lorraine K. Lee, and we're working with Tiny CFO now. So there's a handful of companies that we work with. And I think now we're at a place where the model is, is more refined, our worksheets, our systems, our processes are, are getting really, really tight. Yeah. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to see us now pour some gasoline on it and get some more people going through the program yeah. uh, to, to help more people get results. How do you think about your competitors, things like Udemy and sort of LinkedIn training and this sort of stuff? How, how does your business compare to theirs? So the big difference is there's two, two, two big things. One, the courses that you'll find on platforms like Udemy or LinkedIn Learning, those are what we call evergreen courses. So think of a bookstore where you walk in, you buy the, the course and you figure it out for yourself. Yeah. There's value in those type of, types of courses, but what we see in the data is that only about 10 to 15% of people that buy an off-the-shelf course like that complete it. I know. I've seen that. I've seen that statistic, and I've challenged a few. Sorry to cut across, but I, I've challenged a few people on, these, on my podcast that do these online courses with you get 20% completion rate, which is really shocking. Sorry, go, go ahead, but I've heard that statistic as well, which, which concerns me as well. 
Right, so one issue is the completion rate. And if the person isn't completing the, the course, they're not getting the ultimate transformation, meaning that they're probably not going to talk about your business, meaning that you're going to have to go out and find another customer. Yeah. So in other words, you don't have marketing built into your business. Whereas what we do, we help people to, to achieve success. Like nobody is going to walk away from us without reaching their goal. Like we, that's our guarantee is we're going to work with you until you reach it. Even if, you know, we have to work for you for five years. Um, so I think there's that side um, that we, we compete in a different way. We don't create, um, I'd say almost all of our customers, actually all of our customers, they've created cohort-based courses. And so these are courses where you join a group and you do the course with them and you go through the materials with them. This cohort-based course model is very interesting because it, it brings together this off-the-shelf evergreen with coaching. Mm. And coaching is so, so important and the community is so important for those two other factors that I mentioned before, which are not just learning the skills, but having support emotionally and psychologically as you're building these new habits and building a new identity. Because the reason why you're here on this side of the bridge and you want to get to here to have this transformation is because you don't have the habits and the mindsets of the person that's on this other side. Hmm. If you want to be good at sales and you take a sales course, well, the reason why you're not doing good at sales is because you don't have the habits, the processes, and the frameworks to get there. And you can't just read a book. You have to practice. You have to implement it. And as you're practicing and implement, you need feedback, either from somebody that's going to coach you directly or from other people in the community that can say, Mark, I think you could have spoken up. I think your positioning could have been different. I think your, your pitch could have changed like this. So those are the two things that I, I, that I see that are different from a Udemy or LinkedIn. And when I was looking at your, when I was researching you, it said that your business model had moved from an agency to a coaching. So are you now, are you coaching the course providers or are you coaching the people on the courses? So I'm co coaching the people that have their own courses. Right. So let's say Mark, maybe he has a, Mark Hayward has a podcasting course, for example. I would coach you, Mark, to help you to get more sales for your podcast course yeah right okay that's interesting well, what's the difference because one of my friends does an e-learning course so he's very much in um in building online courses for uh, he does it for hospitality and things like that for, due to regulations and things like that changes in regulations in the uk and things like that and he builds e-learning courses uh, do you do you do you build you build the courses as well do you the actual not, the actual online segment of it i don't i do not build the courses um i can consult and provide some some frameworks and some some thinking on how to structure your course how to name your course for 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 your marketing but i, I don't build courses you do, do you have an outsource that helps you that you work with i don't actually i don't i should Maybe I should have somebody like that 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 works on and a, an affiliate like a more, partnership with them. Yeah, like a pedagogical type of person. Just an idea. Um, yeah, cool. How did you help uh, a client market and sell a course for six figures in sales in a hundred days? Pardon? Sorry, I'm sorry. I was just writing. Um, how did you help a client market and sell a course for six figures in sales within a hundred days? Yeah, so this, this case was with uh, Capital Allocators. They came to us with, I, I like to say, a, a back of the napkin type of sketch of a, of a course. They had an idea. They had some conversations with some of their customers. And they, they came to me because they had taken another course. And they say, hey, we know that you helped this guy market his course. Can you help us market this one? We don't have the course yet. And so I walked them through my program. And I basically helped them to structure the course and to market it to their existing list. And um, it, was, it was great. Like in, in our program, we have about, we have three phases and each phase has three subsets. So there's nine steps in total. They only went through about eight or seven and they didn't implement everything, all the recommendations we made. And they made over a hundred, over a hundred K in sales. And so that was so exciting. Uh, it was super fun. It was super fast. And yeah, it's, uh, you can check them out, capitalallocators.com.
I think you can sign up for Capital Allocators University. I think they might have a, have a spot opening if you're into to finance. Okay, yeah. awesome. What's the marketing strategies that you use uh, for these courses? So there's three essential steps that goes into the marketing mark. Uh, the first step is refining the product. So we get super clear on who the right avatar is, what the value proposition is, what is that key transformation that your student's looking for? And then we put that into messaging that resonates with your audience. The second part that we work on is a funnel. So we help them build uh, landing pages and lead magnets, which is something hard to do, figuring out what part of your course can you give away for free without giving everything away. So that's one thing that we work on with them. And in the funnel part, we also help them with email automation. So we help them set up nurturing emails that help convert people from cold leads into prospects. And then the last part is we pour some gasoline on top of it with some traffic. So we do that both with uh, what we call this audience amplification, where we help you find amplifiers out there in the marketplace that can send you traffic. And then the last bit is we use Facebook ads as well. So on, when I was doing the research, it said, actually, which is similar to what you said, I just want to break this down, these, these areas down to clarifying the ideal client, highlighting key transformation and building excitement for the launch. So let's break down each of these sets. So how do you help your clients find their avatar, their ideal client? Yeah, so usually the process starts with asking them who they've worked with that they've really helped transform. Usually if you have a course, if you're at the point where you're, you're able to create a course, you've probably gone through this process of whatever you're teaching a handful of times. And if you've done it successfully, you've had some happy customers. And so that's a really good place to start is who has paid you money and gotten a real transformation. We start there as a point of starting from your strengths to help you identify who do you want to serve and who do you know that you could really help. That's where we start. And from there, we kind of just go up from there. So, okay, this is, the ba this is where we want to start. Okay, well, let's go to market and let's see, okay, what, is, who, who are, what are some competing options out there in terms of courses or books or resources that people can hire to get the same transformation? And in those options, what is missing from them? And how can we fill them? So, for example, you could take an example off of Amazon. For example, let's say you teach a course about, again, let's say podcasting. And you know that out in the marketplace, there are other courses on podcasting, but you don't just look at their websites, you look at Amazon and you look at the top selling books on podcasting. And you might look at the, 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 the reviews and say, okay, what, what are the one stars, two stars and three stars saying about these courses or these books about, and can they, are they highlighting any gaps in the offer? All right, so that's a good place for you to high, uh, figure out um, who you want to serve and, and, and how you want to serve them. And then the second point is about transforming the key, highlighting the key transformation of the course. So, so how, how, do you, how do you work with your clients to highlight those, those points? Yeah, so this is a very, something very interesting. I only learned, learned about this last year. And it, it's, it's a solution for the problem of vagueness. The, one of the, the biggest challenges that you have of a course creator today is falling on deaf ears. You could have the best course in the world, but if nobody knows about you, if your avatar doesn't know about it, you're never going to make sales and you're going to be in the lurch. What you want to do is you want to avoid that with clarity. And one way to do that is to find one word. If your course could only stand for one word, what would that be? And this one word, the way we teach it is we want, want it to have value, right? So we, we call it the standout value. Is it, is it revenue? Is it leads? Is it bookings? Is it you know, interviews, what is that one keyword that these per people are, are keeping them up at night mm -hmm. that, that, that passes this 2 a.m. problem, mm -hmm. this 2 a.m. this 2 a.m. problem is that they're up at 2 a.m. It's like, man, if I could only have more, what is that word that they're, that's filling in that blank? Because sometimes what people will do is they'll call their course or they'll name their course or they'll have a headline for their course, which is learn to dominate your market, become the authority in your workplace what what does that mean right sure you have an idea but what is the real measurable outcome of that if i'm the authority then does that mean that i have a higher I, I i'm in a higher pay grade i got promoted i you know what i mean like what is that measurable if we can do that it's important for you to do that for your course so that it it becomes more clear 
to your avatar what he's, he or she is going to get out of it. So we're going to go into point three is about building excitement for the launch. But this sounds like uh, some really developed marketing strategies and, and, and building a marketing strategy for, for an online course. Is, is that essentially what you're doing? Yes. Yeah. So we, a lot of the times what you might think of when you're doing marketing, if you think about marketing for a course, is you think about all the flashy and popular and, and trendy things. Mm. Oh, I need to do Facebook ads. I need a pop-ups. I need, you know, lead magnets. I need all these techie automations and funnels and webinars that zoom out and ping you and do all these things. You cannot get there without going to the fundamentals first. And that's something that we really hammer really hard is these key fundamentals. What makes you different with your course? Why the heck does somebody stop in their tracks and, and give you their attention? Mm. So the, answering your question about the third part about building excitement, yeah. this is, this is a, a, actually the fun part. Once you're ready to start building excitement, this is all about audience building and building scarcity and urgency about your offer. So once you have a timeline for when you're ready to launch, Using urgency, which is um, a time-based uh, situation, that can greatly enhance. And we've seen in all of our launches, whenever we open cart, let's say if we do a seven-day launch, usually five to 10, 10 of sales will come in in the first uh, few days, first two days. But then 60, 80 plus percent will come in the last like 24 hours. Because you send out a few emails at the very end stating doors are closing. The opportunity ends. You create the sense of urgency in, this, in people. And we all have this natural psychological bias to not want to miss out on things. And urgency is a really good way to, to trigger that. Another thing that builds excitement is scarcity. So if you say, look, the opportunity is going, but also the opportunity is only limited to you know, this many spots. That, then you combine both of these psychological triggers together. Yeah. And you can layer on some more psychological triggers too by um, layering on things like social proof. So if you're doing a launch with a partner that layers on some social proof with the scarcity, with the urgency, then you're really cooking with, with gas. Awesome. Um, who inspired you when you were a teenager? Huh. Who inspired me when I was a teenager? I think the, the person that I remember the most from my teenage years was Ronaldo, the soccer player. Brazilian? I just, yeah, the Brazil, I just wanted to be like Ronaldo so bad. I wanted to play like him, wear my hair like him. I just, oh my God, obsessed. He was brilliant, wasn't he? He really was exceptional. Yeah, he was awesome. And, wh and what was it, what was it that, that, that attracted obviously he was a great footballer very successful but what what was what was it about him that really sort of uh inspired you uh to to sort of emulate so i think about his play and, and then the, the, I'll, I'll answer the the obvious question then i'll answer the underneath question the obvious question was yeah he was a great footballer he was he was extremely fast um top speed but he was also super quick with the ball at his feet. He, would, he, would, he, he was fearless. Uh, he would go at defenders. He would dribble. He would go past them. He wasn't the type of player that he would, he would sort of put the ball beside you and run. He would go through you. He would leave you in the, in the dirt. And so he had this, this really great ability to get past people. And then in front of the, the net, he was just absolutely deadly. The way he would handle the space and goalkeepers, the way he would shoot at the net is just amazing. His sense of space, his sense of, where he is on the field and he can kick the ball at a certain angle and get it is just amazing so that's the, the 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 top level question is yeah i wanted to be like him i thought it was great and everything but i think the underneath question is like um I, I don't know about you but i've i've always done this this guru hopping this guru worshiping I've always looked at other people like these great people and seen like, man, that guy is so great. This lady is so great. This person is so great. And I've wanted to be like them or wanted to achieve like them, like some kind of social status or fame or success um, or just mastery of a skill. And he, he really emulated a lot of those things. And he was a master. He was a famous. He was successful. So all those qualities are, some, are things that, that really... Uh, 
were of, of interest to me as a teenager. Fantastic, thank you. Um, how did you help a client add $350,000 in organic revenue? Yeah, so this is going back to the days when I was doing a lot of SEO work, so search engine optimization. Oh. We worked with a client who has a, a franchise of beauty bars here in Canada. They've expanded to the U.S. now as well. And really, just by, just by doing the fundamental SEO work that you have to do, we were able to, to help them grow. It helps that they had a great business, and it also helps that their competitors were, were not as structured as them. When you look at the, the space of um, local businesses and local businesses doing, doing nails and things like that, a lot of the times what you'll find is that they're not professionalized. They're not franchised. They're not, they don't have processes. Mm. Meaning that it's not that hard to, to create happier customers than them, right? If we go back to the original question of the business mindset. Whereas this franchise, they create happy customers like clockwork. So that's, that's how we did it. SEO was, was fanta it's fantastic for, for local business and we help them add a lot of money to their bottom line. Amazing, thank you. Um, what's the plan for the next two to five years? Hmm. Honestly, Mark, I don't have a plan that far ahead. Um, okay. for, for right now, six months to a year, our plan is simply to get more people into our program. Uh, we're doing the soft launch with another partner agency of our of our course. So as I said, we we have been working one on one with clients, and now we're we're looking to do more group um, engagements. So we can take a number of course creators and help all of them together at the same time. And so ideally, what we like to do, I, what all I like to do is focus on that for the for the rest of this year, and then scale from there. Maybe it, it'll grow through a piece of software. Maybe what we have now will turn into a piece of software. Or I'm, I, I don't really know what will happen after that, but um, if we can help a hundred course creators, you know, get to six figures, I'd be, I'd be very happy. Really great idea. Really great idea. Okay, we're coming to the end of the interview. I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer, and they've been described as a little bit thought provoking as well. What's the best decision that you made? Getting married. Good answer. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Best piece of advice. Hmm. I think it was um, don't sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. Don't sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. Okay. So live for live for today. It's it's you know, live for today, plan for tomorrow type of thing yeah yeah it's just more poetic <laughs> sorry i had to work that out in my head to <laughs> the meaning but no it's it's a fantastic quote because i think living presently living living life for today is um is something that we don't always prioritize there's always some people negatively think of yesterday um of, of the past and then some people are obsessed with living in the future and what's going to happen so living in presently in today is a really good is a really positive way of living your life um who helped you most in your career hmm. Oof. i would have to say this guy named christian Contreras. his probably and it's it's funny because he's helped me so much but so effortlessly okay it's and it's it's this he just opened so many doors for me. He's introduced me to a few key people. And those few key people have led me to other key people. But I, I always see these people that I'm connected with today back to him. It was like this, this phone call, this meeting, this, these little things that he did for me that just absolutely helped me accelerate to where I am today. You do need key people just to help you along the way because you, you you're not an island that you you do need we all need help we all need support from from people so i'm, yep. I'm glad you gave him a shout out it's uh it, it's, it's good um any regrets regrets in what in what regard could be personal or professional whatever you'd like to share with me or it might not be it might be that you don't regret anything which i often get with this question i often get 
um, I don't regret anything on the sum of all my parts, which is true. I get that. But equally, I, I think everyone has a regret. Everyone has something that they wish they'd done differently. Not that it would change you, but just something that mm -hmm. you think, well, if I'd have made that choice differently, it could have led to something positive or something good. Yeah, so I think the biggest regret that I have is worrying about social proof, worrying about what other people think. I think there's something that I've had with me since I was since I was in high school for sure. And it's taken a long time to let go. And it's still something I think I struggle with. It's still something that I consciously have to write, actually write down and and think about. Don't give an F about what people other people think. Stop giving a crap about what people think. It's something that I have to remind myself about. So I think in a general way, I, I would say that you know, stopping to to think about what other people think from not asking a girl to dance, not wearing something I thought was not dancing a certain way that I thought would be cool, not saying something in class that I know the answer to. It's it's the tiny things, mm. right? It's 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 really the tiny things that make up uh, the sum of the, that that feeling of regret. I think it's not one moment it's like oh my god, if I would have done. If I would have turned left when I should have turned right, I don't. I don't think life is like that. But I think it's the that that belief is is limiting, and it's uh, it's something that I regret allowing that belief to to participate in my life for so long. I hope you don't mind me asking. How have you overcome that? What what strategies have you used to overcome that? Just being aware of it. I, I think I've done a lot of work personally on. There's this, there's this book I read three years ago, and I did the work in the book. It's like a workbook. It's called, uh, it's from this author named Mastin Kip. You can find him on Instagram. He's, um, he's really good. I think it's called Unlimited Power or Gain Your Power or something like that. And in the book, it's like a 40-day workbook, which you buy the book. It has like these, these guides these prompts, and then it has like these questions for you to answer and like reflect on. And in there, I ended up doing a lot, and I filled up a whole journal just worth of answers to these questions. And you have to really think deeply and you meditate and you really. And so that was a really big opening point to the self reflection and the self discovery of these, these aspects and these underlying beliefs and, and behaviors and habits. And um, I think that was like a really big catalyst for helping me to continue to do that so i'll revisit these ideas every so often not as religiously as i should either on a monthly or weekly or we'll see it's like an annual quarterly basis that i'll go back to them mm -hmm. but every now and then they come up and they, i remind myself like yesterday last night to give you a good example i was so tired i think i woke up at like 2 a.m and i didn't go back to sleep and so the whole day i was tired i was like I'm, I'm running around right i have two kids uh, they're, they're little, the little one is crying, is scratching his head, it's got issues. My son is talking back to me. Uh, I'm like, man, let's, let's just cooperate. I'm tired at night and I'm reaching for cookies and I'm trying to stay off my cookies. And at that point, I, could, I kind of like had this, just, just like this awareness. I'm like, man, I'm like spiraling right here. I'm starting to get pissed. I'm starting to reach for snacks. I'm about to yell. I'm about to lose it. I need to just take a breath. So I like sat on the couch, took some deep breaths, looked at the situation. I'm like, look, I'm blessed. I have two beautiful children. My wife is awesome. We're home. We're safe. I got this. That simple thing, if I hadn't done that, I probably would have, I don't even know, like filled Shout stuff. My, yeah, yeah shouted, <laughs> stuff, shouted, stuffed my face you know, not slept, had a, had a worse night and worked up and woken up worse. And I would not have been prepared for you today. So um, it's really interesting. Someone um, who I interviewed a few months back just before Christmas, and uh, he's all about getting your mindset right and everything. It's really fascinating interview with Chris Mahefka. And, uh, and he said, we all have a superpower. And that's exactly what you did slow your breath down slow yourself down slow down your mentally and physically by a deep breathing he said oh, you only need four or five or six of them and that will create an equilibrium again you'll 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 stop seeing red the rage or, or whatever you're, you're feeling the emotional or anger or whatever it is and he said this is a superpower which most people don't even know they have 
And it's really interesting. You, you, you actually did exactly what he suggests. And he, he's trying to push this at, across the globe that, that actually sometimes just because it, it's all about feeling safe again, that sort of, if you're in that sort of heightened emotional or anger, uh, his like uh, in ancient times you would it would be because you were going to be attacked or you were under threat where if you slow your breath down and you slow yourself down you get to that that safety zone again and then you can start thinking clearly again about what you want to do dealing with your kids dealing with a difficult client dealing with I don't know, your wife your mother whatever it is um and I think like, it was really fascinating with the way you talked through that. I could see the way you talked through it, that you it was that transition stage of heightened emotional state into that sort of place where you were like, I'm grateful for what I've got. I, I've got this. Let's move forward. So I think that's really it's really telling. It's very interesting that you you shared that, um, because I think that a lot of people can use that technique. And actually, it can be super powerful as well. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. That's I, I didn't think it was that important, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. Next one. Um, what are you most proud of? And besides, you know, my kids, uh, I would say. I think being able to adapt has been something I think that's something I'm proud of. Like I told you, I've moved around a lot with with my mom. And when I was 18, when I moved to Vienna, that was a hard transition. And when I moved back to Ottawa, and then I moved back to Brazil, those transitions for me were, were really hard. And I'm proud that I was able to get through it so well. I, I thought I, like looking back, certain moments were difficult, and I didn't do so well, but other moments, I, I thought I did well. And I think today, that's really what I I try to pass on to my clients is flexibility. We can always change. We can always adapt. Mm -hmm. um, we can always, and, and, and a lot of that goes into messaging and marketing. This is something that is refinement till the end. You could live your life refining, but you want to make sure that you get from a point of, when we take this into marketing, for example, you want to get from a place of, of confusion to a place of clarity. If you can make your message at least clear, you'll be ahead of 80% of the market because a lot of people out there and courses and, and offers, they just don't speak clearly to, to, to one avatar about one clear transformation. Excellent. Thank you. What does legacy mean to you? <laughs> legacy. I think legacy is, is, is a word that people like to think about, you know, if they have really big egos. I think for me, legacy really is just doing the best that you can, you can being the best that you absolutely can be and striving for, for creating a better world after you leave. I think if, and that, I think that'll look different for everybody, right? What a better world looks like for you might not be the exact same thing as it means for me. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's what I would say legacy is. Awesome. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? They can find me at nerddigital.com. That's N-E-R-D-D-I-G-I-T-A-L.com. And if they go to nerddigital.com forward slash Mark, I will have a special gift for them waiting. Wonderful. And where did the name come from, Nerd Digital, then? That was, that was some kind of brainstorm that happened uh, at 3 p.m. at work with the stuffed belly and a lot of laughter in the room. I was at work and we were throwing a, around these, these things. I used to read up a lot of obviously gaming and, and gadget and infotech type of news. Mm. And I think somebody, there's this term like a nerd is something that, that is always thrown around. And then digital was, was always, I don't know. I think it was just like, you know, I just a lucky a lucky moment that that I happened to write down on a piece of paper. Amazing. Thank you, Marcio. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mark.